and welcome to the daily news simplified the what why and how of newspaper reading today we'll be analyzing the delhi edition of the hindu newspaper dated 19th february 2019 the topics to be discussed today are reflected on your screen and the time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below so let's begin this news is an article appearing on page number 8 and in this article the author is talking about the plight of contract workers especially the ones involved in the field of sanitation from a syllabus perspective it will fall under gs paper 2 under the category of social issues and under the subcategory of mechanisms laws and institutions for the protection and betterment of vulnerable sections as well as issues relating to development of human resources the context of this article was set in the recent death of a sanitation worker who was called to clean a drain in delhi and who later died due to asphyxiation so as part of a discussion we'll be talking about the points raised by the author but we'll also be looking at manual scavenging as well as the status of sanitation workers presently in our country now the issue of manual scavenging was covered in detail in the september issue of 2018 of the focus manual scavenging is defined as the practice of manually cleaning manually means with use of hands and not with use of any equipments So manual scavenging is the manual cleaning, carrying, disposing or even handling in any manner human excreta from dry latrines and sewers. So does any person who handles in any manner human excreta in an insanitary latrine and insanitary latrine is a dry latrine or in an open drain or pit into which the human excreta from the insanitary latrine is disposed or even from a railway track? or in such other spaces or premises as the central government or state government may notify so to get the general idea manual scavenging is the manual cleaning disposing or handling of untreated excreta from dry latrines as well as sewers as well as railway tracks as mentioned it is usually done with hands using the most basic tools like buckets brooms and baskets so all these people do not have proper equipments or even protective gears like gloves and masks while they are cleaning these latrines and sewers manual scavenging in india is not just a job it has lot more implications especially in the social context in fact manual scavenging is the worst surviving symbol of caste untouchability in our country because currently it is only the so called lower caste people who are expected to do this job thus manual scavenging is a caste based occupation so you can very well imagine given the situation that manual scavengers are one of the most marginalized and poorest communities in india who have a very poor social and economical standing in our society another very important issue related to manual scavenging is the loss of life a lot of manual scavengers lose their lives while doing the job because they inhale toxic fumes or sometimes get stuck in these drains and sewers and die of asphyxiation now looking at the plight of the people engaged in this occupation The government over the period of time has come out with lot of acts and legislations to improve the situation. The first law on manual scavenging was enacted in the year 1993 known as the Employment of Manual Scavenging and Construction of Dry Latrines Prohibition Act. Now as per this act what happened is that government banned the employment of people as manual scavengers for manually cleaning dry latrines and also for the construction of dry toilets. So as per this act the government say that no person can be employed to clean dry latrines in the country and to ensure that these vulnerable people are not exploited the government even banned the construction of dry toilets so altogether the government said that dry toilets will no longer be constructed in our country so as to ensure that people are not employed to manually clean these dry latrines though employment of manual scavengers became a criminal offense nobody was charged with employing workers in almost 20 years up till the year 2013 when another act related to manual scavenging was enacted so in 2013 the government came out with prohibition of employment of manual scavengers and their rehabilitation act so this act in addition to prohibiting manual scavenging in the country looked at even rehabilitating people who were thought to working as manual scavengers in our country so as we were discussing in 1993 act only the people who were cleaning dry latrines were recognized as manual scavengers but this act widened the definition of who could be a manual scavenger and said that even people 
who clean septic tanks and railway tracks would fall under the category of manual scavengers as defined in this act so now the 2013 act prohibited manual scavenging in all its form and ensured the rehabilitation of such people who were working as manual scavengers now this definition which we discussed in the beginning right here is the one which has been taken from this 2013 act but you need to understand that there remains a descriptive fallacy as far as definition of manual scavenging is concerned even as per the 2013 act because the definition of manual scavengers as per this act is very narrow and excludes a wide variety of workers for example this definition does not include sanitation work such as drain cleaning or even the cleaning of toilets by domestic help further as per this act latrine cleaners railway cleaners sewer cleaners and fecal sludge handlers are recognized as manual scavengers so therefore this major law does not include drain workers drain cleaners people who are working in the waste treatment plant people who are employed for cleaning public or community toilets or even domestic helps for that matter who are employed by almost all middle class family and are doing these menial jobs of cleaning toilets thus you can understand that there still remains a lot of lacuna as far as definition of manual scavenging is concerned because till the time you do not efficiently recognize what is manual scavenging you really can make an effort to improve the situation further in the 2014 based on the judgment of the supreme court a directive was issued which said that even sewer workers will be included in the definition of this act so therefore currently as per the 2000 13 act septic tank workers railway tracks cleaner as well as sewer cleaner are included in the definition of manual scavenging but still as we discussed drain cleaners your domestic help or people who clean public toilets are not included recognizing the complexity of the issue various initiatives have been started by the government the first of course as we discussed was the 2013 prohibition of manual scavenging act which has banned manual scavenging across india in all its form and has made manual scavenging and has made it a non bailable offense further the government is running a central sector scheme called self employment scheme for rehabilitation of manual scavengers under which identified manual scavengers and their dependents are given one time cash assistance of 40000 rupees or loans up to 15 lakhs at concessional rates The major step towards eliminating manual scavenging is the Swachh Bharat Mission through which the government aims to eliminate the need for manual scavenging in the first place. Thus under the Swachh Bharat Mission government wants to construct proper modern and functioning toilets as well as better sewage systems. In addition to all those initiatives what the government requires to do is to have better and stricter implementation of the current laws especially the 2013 act. and in addition to that the government should try to improve the sewage as well as the sludge management system in our country so that there isn't a need for a person to come and manually clean a sewage or a sludge system lastly let us also talk about the author's view which he has presented in this article the first thing which the author is saying that studies and research have found out that these sanitation workers basically work as contract workers for both the private sector as well as the government sector you would already be knowing that the indian railways is the largest employer of sanitation workers in our country and a lot of this employment by the government is not done directly but via private contractors so what happens is that government delegates this duty to private contractors to get railway tracks or other premises clean then these private contractors hire the sanitation worker on contract basis and get the work done further the author says that we do not really know what exactly is the share of these contractual workers working in the sanitation industry but what we know for sure is the nexus or the connection between caste and the sanitation work so the author points out that sanitation workers on contract mostly belong to the scheduled caste category and a lot of surveys have pointed towards this thus bring on the fact that sanitation work is related to a particular caste and only people belonging to the so called lower caste are expected to do this work thirdly the author has said that contract work especially in the sphere of sanitation leads to gross exploitation and vulnerability for these sanitation workers especially at the hand of these private contractors 
these private contractors do not pay the sanitation worker the promised amount and are at liberty to cut their payments as and when they like further the author says even the government or the bureaucracy for that matter has not shown any interest to actually ensure whether these private contractors are giving the sanitation workers their just full due so in the end what happens is that these sanitation workers they work with small time contractors who themselves have no idea what exactly is the role of a sanitation worker thus these contractors exploit these workers and do not even provide them with proper safety equipments further even the government does not provide any proper training to these sanitation workers because very sadly for the government and for the society sanitation is a work which really does not require any training thus what the government and the contractors fail to understand is that sanitation is a complex work which requires both knowledge and training lastly the author says that all these sanitation campaigns do not talk or do not even acknowledge the relationship between caste and this sanitation work because the truth is for the general society as well everybody very subconsciously thinks that these works are supposed to be done by people of the lower caste so therefore the author says so whenever a situation or a incident like this is reported in the news where a sanitation worker has died due to asphyxiation the entire narrative and the news revolves around the background of the story and none of the media houses or anyone for that matter wants to address the issue of the caste and work nexus now based on discussion please try and attempt this mains question which reads sanitation in india is still a caste based occupation in light of the statement discuss the issue of manual scavenging in india with this let's move on to our next news this news appears on page number 3 and is talking about the rajasthan government's social accountability bill so as part of our discussion we'll be looking at the provisions of this social accountability bill and we'll also be understanding what exactly social accountability means from the perspective of the syllabus it will fall under gs paper 2 in the sub topic of important aspects of governance transparency and accountability now at the heart of social accountability lies the concept of constructive engagement between the citizens and the government the social accountability is a means of citizens engagement now this engagement between the citizens and the government in the concept of social accountability is to check the conduct and performance of the public officials or the government in general so as the term would suggest social accountability is a way in which the ordinary citizen or the society in general is empowered and are given means to hold the government accountable for the various duties and functions it is mandated with now the rational behind given ordinary people such kind of power is that ordinary citizens and the society in general have a direct stake in the allocation as well as the use of public resources by the government officials because at the end of the day your government is a representative of the people thus people have the authority and the power to ask the government how and where it is spending all those resources and the funds which the ordinary citizen is contributing thus it is believed that since the government uses money which comes from the pockets of ordinary citizens ordinary citizens are inherently motivated to participate in the government's decision making further as far as the approach of social accountability is concerned it basically presumes two things first is that government itself is very willing for people's participation that is to say that even government is open for people's participation in its decision making and governance process second presumption it makes is that citizen too are willing to engage with the government thus presuming these two things in mind social accountability is an engagement which goes beyond the superficial ways of of interacting now this rajasthan social accountability bill is a first of its kind effort in india where the government is trying to make a law which will make the public functionaries accountable for the timely delivery of goods and services but before we talk about what rights are given we first need to understand the applicability of this bill that is to which all public officials will this bill apply and for what situations now this bill is applicable to all public servants which carry out public functions and all these public servants will include even officials who work on contractual basis either full time or part time under the state government further this bill 
also includes all those private entities, voluntary organization or other such bodies which are performing a public function in partnership with the state government. So if a private entity or a company or even say an NGO, if it has partnered with the Rajasthan government to deliver public goods and services, then that private entity or NGO too would be held accountable and would be required to fulfill its obligation as per this act. So this was basically what all officials are including. Second, in what context can the grievances be made under this act? So this act will apply to all those grievances relating to the time-bound delivery of any public good, service or entitlement which is envisaged under any law, policy, program, scheme or even budgetary announcement at all the three levels, that is at the central, state or even at the local government's level. So, for example, let's just take uh, PM Kisan scheme. So, under the PM Kisan scheme, the farmer is entitled to three installments of 2,000 each. So, this scheme the central government has announced in its interim budget. So, if the state government does not disperse this installment to the farmer, then as per this act, the farmer is entitled to file a grievance under this act in order to get his entitlement. Let us now look at some of the rights available to the people under the Rajasthan Social Accountability Bill. The number one, as we discussed, which is also the main objective of this act, is the right time-bound delivery of goods and provisions of services. Thus, the first right is that every person in the state of Rajasthan is entitled to get delivery of goods and services in a time-bound manner. Now, what goods or services is a person entitled to? This information or knowledge too has to be provided to the citizens. Thus, the second right is the right to be informed of the various goods and services which a citizen is entitled through a notified and well-disseminated citizen charter as per the provision of this act. A citizen charter is a document which declares all the functions, obligations, duties of a public authority under any law, policy, program or scheme. So the third point flows from the citizen charter and says that the people have the right to be informed of the obligations and duties of public officials in the delivery of goods and services. So you can remember this this way. First of all, the person is entitled to a time-bound delivery of goods and services. But to know whether a person has been given time-bound delivery of goods and services, the person first needs to know what all goods and services is he entitled to. And that becomes the second right, that is right to be informed about the goods and services the person is entitled to. Now the third is which public officials or which authority would be giving them that goods and services. So the third right is the right to be informed about the obligations and duties of the public officials regarding the delivery of goods and services. Now after all these three, if the person finds that he has not been given the timely delivery of goods and services, then that person has the right to file a grievance complaint and also has the right to ensure that such grievance is redressed as per the provision of this act. So therefore, this bill seeks to create the office of a grievance redressal officer on whom the duty will be charged to ensure that his department obliges and completes whatever duty or obligation is cast over them. Further, this bill says that the person has the right to dispose of their grievance within 30 days of filing the grievance. And in the case the grievance is not disposed within 30 days, they have the right to appeal to an independent appellate authority created at the divisional or the district level as well as the state level. Lastly, realizing that people can be intimidated or harassed by the public officials and can back out in the last moment from complaining, this bill has also given the right to people to demand for protection from intimidation and harassment relating to the complaints they file against public authorities. So in a way, if you will analyze, you will realize that this act goes one step ahead of the Right to Information Act because it has made the information about various goods and services and the duties of official compulsory under this act and in case people are not given the information or are not delivered with the goods and services, they have the right to file a grievance and for that they have created the grievance redressal officer on whom they have put the onus to ensure that his departments and officials do whatever work they have been given. So in conclusion, the key provision of the bill, of course, is firstly that it wants to create accountability of public functionaries. 
so that goods and services entitled to people are delivered on time and the main aim of creating such mechanism is to promote democratic decentralized and participative approach to the governance process another very important thing you need to remember that this bill proposes imposition of penalties and compensation against the grievance redressal officer of the service delivery department for non compliance that is to say if any department does not comply with the delivery of a service or a good then the grievance redressal officer of that department will be imposed with penalty and that penalty or the compensation shall be recovered from the salary of that grievance redressal official against whom the penalty has been imposed last as we discussed is that this law will complement the right to information act now in the year 2016 in your gs paper 2 a question was asked relating the participation of people in the governance process so you can try and attempt this question based on our discussion with this let's move on to our next news this next news appears on page number 1 and is in the context of the kulbhushan jadhav case now the public hearing have commenced at the international court of justice in the case of the indian national kulbhushan jadhav who was sentenced to death on charges of espionage by the pakistani military court from the perspective of his syllabus it will fall under gs paper 2 in the category of international relation before we discuss further let us very briefly talk about the background of this kulbhushan jadhav case now kulbhushan jadhav is a former indian navy officer who was arrested by pakistan from the balochistan province in the year 2016 after he reportedly entered pakistan from iran however india says that kulbhushan jadhav was kidnapped by a terrorist organization from iran and then was handed over to pakistan now in the year 2017 pakistani military court convicted and sentenced kulbhushan yadav with death for espionage and sabotage activities against pakistan espionage is the practice of spying or using spies to obtain information about the plans and activities especially of a foreign government so then subsequently this kulbhushan yadav case was forwarded by india to the international court of justice where as of now the court has directed pakistan to take all measures to ensure that kulbhushan yadav is not executed until the final decision is given by the international court of justice let us now understand the main point of contentions raised by india in the international court of justice the first point is related to consular access so india has accused pakistan of violating the vienna convention on consular relations 1963 as pakistan has not given indian consular access to kulbhushan jadhav to simply put consular access is the ability of a foreign national in some other foreign country to have access to consulate or embassy officials of his own home country so this vienna convention on consular relationship is an international treaty that defines consular relations between two independent states so now what pakistan is saying is that this vienna convention is not applicable to spies and terrorists and therefore Pakistan has the right to deny consular access to Kulbhushan Yadav but please bear in mind that as far as Vienna convention is concerned the convention itself does not make any exception for people who are suspected of committing espionage or terrorism related offenses and further even the international court of justice has not interpreted this Vienna convention to exclude offenses such as espionage or terrorism the second point which india has raised is that the military court which convicted kulbhushan yadav did not give him a free and a fair trial in fact this contention of india has also been supported by the observations from the international commission of jurists who documented how the pakistani military courts are not really independent in their functioning even in the past and the way in which they carry out their procedure is not up to the mark of national and international fair trial standards now in addition to these two things India and Pakistan themselves bilaterally signed an agreement on consular access in 2008. Now this consular access agreement says that any person detained has to be given consular access within 3 months. However, this bilateral agreement does have a provision that in case the arrest or detention is made on political or security grounds, then this provision of providing consular access can be waived off. and it is this 2008 agreement between india and pakistan 
on which Pakistan is relying and saying that this bilateral agreement between India and Pakistan overrides the obligation under the Vienna Convention. But of course, India is saying that this 2008 agreement does not override the Vienna Convention. So in totality, this is the entire case related to Kulbhushan Yadav. Let us now look at International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. It was established by the United Charter, which was signed in 1945 in San Francisco, and it is headquartered in Hague, Netherlands. So please remember that out of the six principal organs of the United Nations, International Court of Justice is the only organ whose headquarter is located outside New York, that is in the city of Hague in Netherlands. Further, the International Court of Justice comprises of 15 judges who are elected for a term of nine years by the United Nations General Assembly and the UN Security Council. As far as the role of International Court of Justice is concerned, it plays the dual role under which, firstly, it settles legal dispute between states and the second role played by it is to give advisory opinion on legal matters which is referred to it by the United Nations organs and specialized agencies. Now the question is, who may submit the cases to the International Court of Justice? Please remember, only the United Nations member states are eligible to appear before this court. Further, International Court of Justice does not have suo-moto cognizance. That is, it cannot deal with a dispute of its own motion. So therefore, under the ICJ, the country has to come and submit a case to it and only then can it try it. The third thing to remember is that International Court of Justice has no jurisdiction to deal with applications from individuals, NGOs or corporation or any other private entities. That is to say, it only tries cases between the member states, that is between countries and not between individuals, NGOs, corporations or any other private entity. But now you may think that how Kulbushan Yadav's case, who is an individual, has been brought to the International Court of Justice. The answer to this is that a country can take up the case of one of its nationals and invoke that case against another state, stating that its national or citizen has suffered at the hands of the latter. Which means that India took up the case of Kulbushan Yadav, who is Indian national, and then said that he has suffered lot of atrocities at the hand of Pakistan. So therefore, the dispute became one between the states, that is between India and Pakistan. Lastly, the judgments given by the International Court of Justice are binding upon the parties concerned and these judgments are final and cannot be appealed against. The only option which a country has is that it can request for interpretation of the judgment. But in the event of a discovery of a fact which was earlier unknown to the International Court of Justice, either party may apply for revision of that judgment. Now what happens a lot many times, students get confused between the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. So therefore, very briefly, we'll look at the difference between the two. Now the International Court of Justice is an organ of the United Nations and was established under the UN Charter, whereas the International Criminal Court was established under the provisions of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. As far as the membership is concerned, only the countries who are member of the UN are de facto members of the International Court of Justice. Whereas for International Criminal Court, only those countries who have ratified the Rome Statutes can become their member. Now for jurisdiction, the International Court of Justice entertains disputes only amongst its member states. So under International Court of Justice, individuals cannot bring their own disputes. But as far as International Criminal Court is concerned, it prosecutes individuals. So therefore, any individual who is accused of crimes of genocide, war crimes, etc. will be tried by the International Court of Justice. Lastly, the ICJ is funded by the United Nations, whereas the International Court of Justice receives compulsory funding from its member and sometimes voluntary funding from the UN or non-member states. With this, let's move on to our next news. This news appears on page number 13 and is talking about the Ministry of Shipping's decision to revise its guidelines for chartering in order to incentivize shipbuilding activity in the country. From your UPSC syllabus, it will form a part of GS Paper 3 under the subcategory of infrastructure. So what has happened is that Ministry of Shipping has revised its guidelines for chartering of ships 
and as per this new revised guidelines the right of first refusal will be given to the ships which are built in india so what exactly is this right of first refusal before we discuss what is right of first refusal you need to know what chartering is so chartering is an activity in the shipping industry whereby a ship owner hires out the use of his or her vehicle to a charterer to simply put if i am a ship owner i would bid my ship in the tendering process so that some other charterer company can use or hire my ship so the hiring out of a vessel by a ship owner to a charterer is known as chartering so when the tendering process for the chartering of vessels is going on then any bidder who would offer a ship which is built in india that bidder will be given first priority this first priority is given in the way is that when tendering process is going on first this bidder who has a ship built in india will be asked for his bidding and it is only when he refuses only then other persons will be asked for their bidding so in a way this bidder who is offering a ship built in india will get the right of first refusal that is only first he will refuse and then the tendering process will go on to other bidders so what used to happen is that before revision of these guidelines this right of first refusal was given to indian flagged vessels now indian flagged vessels are those vessels which are registered in india but are not always necessarily built in india so many times companies would buy vessels built in some other country and then would register it in india so these vessels are indian flagged vessels and they are not always built in india now the benefit of this move is that it will promote the government's make in india campaign even in the sh- ship building sector because currently the shipping industry is dominated by foreign players and the domestic players barely contribute anything in the shipping sector second it is expected that priority given to ships built in india will raise the demand for such vessels and therefore will provide them with additional market access and business support and in this regard the ministry of shipping will soon come out with a policy thus in totality this move aims to give a boost to the domestic ship building industry so as part of our discussion you need to know what is the right of first refusal and that earlier it was given to indian flag vessels but now it will be given to ship built in india with this let's move on to our next news this news appears on page number 13 and is talking about the rbi's transfer of 28000 crore as an interim surplus to the government from a syllabus it will fall under gs paper 3 in the sub category of issues related to indian economy as well as government budgeting now the context of the news is that the central board of the reserve bank of india has decided to transfer 28000 crore rupees to the central government as an interim surplus it is interim because this dividend or surplus is for the half year which ended on 31st december 2018 You should know that this is the second successive year in which the RBI is transferring an interim surplus to the government because even last year in March 2018 RBI had given 10000 crore rupees as interim surplus to the government now do not get confused as to how the half year of an RBI ends in December this is because RBI follows a July June financial year so therefore the first half gets over in December Now this decision by the central board of RBI is very beneficial to the central government because in the interim budget of 2019-20 the government has projected a fiscal deficit of 3.4% of the GDP and now this transfer of interim surplus of 28000 crore is likely to help the government to meet this fiscal deficit target of 3.4% of the GDP but what is very crucial to this news is from where the government gets the power or the right to take such kind of surplus from the RBI the answer lies in section 47 of the RBI act which talks about allocation of surplus profits so as per section 47 of the RBI act if after making provision for bad or doubtful debts after calculating depreciation in efforts after removing the contributions to staff superannuation funds and other matters which pertain to the bankers if the rbi has some profit left then that balance of the profit has to be paid to the central government 
Now we know that this issue of transfer of fund has been a major bone of contention between the RBI and the central government in the wake of which the central board of the RBI had decided in November to set up a committee now after being at loggerheads with one another to resolve the issue of economic capital framework the central board of the RBI in consultation with the government of India decided to constitute an expert committee which would review the existing economic capital framework of the RBI now this committee will be headed by dr bimal jalan who is a former governor of the reserve bank of india and this committee will submit its report within a period of 90 days from the date of its first meeting but let us understand what are the terms of reference for this committee the first and the foremost of course will be to consider the statutory provision of section 47 of the RBI act so while considering the section 47 of the RBI the committee will review the status need and justification of various provisions and will also review the status of the reserves and buffers which are presently provided by the RBI to the central government secondly the committee will also review what are the global best practices followed by central banks in making assessment and provisions for risks secondly this committee will also see that currently the reserves and buffers which are held by the RBI whether they are in surplus or deficit of the required level of such provisions lastly this committee will propose a suitable profit distribution policy between the RBI and the government which will take into account all the situations which are likely to arise for the RBI including the situation in which the RBI is holding more or less provision than is required so this committee and its terms of reference was just for your general understanding we still have to wait for the committee to submit its report and only after that something substantial can come out so with this let's move on to our next news this news appears on page number 18 and is talking about how synthetic fibers contribute to plastic pollution especially in the oceans this news will become a part of environment and ecology so now basically a new research has found that polyester and other synthetic fibers like nylon are major contributors to microplastic pollution in the environment the reason is that synthetic fibers which are basically a petroleum based products are not recyclable and biodegradable like the natural fibers such as wool cotton and silk so basically these synthetic fibers during production processing and even after use break down into further smaller particles and release microfibers which are found everywhere and on everything this issue specially escalates in the ocean where the pieces of such microscopic plastic is consumed by plants and animal and then enter the human food chain also through these harvested fish now an alternative to synthetic fibers are mixed fibers which contain both natural and synthetic fiber but these are not really produced because they are very costly to recycle now let's move on to our practice questions now based on today's discussion here is the first set of practice question please pause the video and solve them we'll discuss the answer after 5 seconds the first question reads Which among the following has become the first state to propose a bill for social accounting? Now the right answer is C, Rajasthan. But also please remember that Meghalaya last year became the first state to come out with a law on social audit. Social audit is different from social accounting. Social audit is when a scheme or a policy is implemented and then the people and the society in general are asked whether the implementation was proper or not. The second question says The revised guidelines for chartering of ship gives right of first refusal to which of the following Now the right answer here is B ship built in India Here are the next set of question please again pause the video and we'll discuss the answer after 5 seconds Question number 3 is in the context of manual scavenging The first statement manual scavenging is prohibited in all its form this statement is right As per the Prohibition of Manual Scavenging Act 2013, manual scavenging is currently prohibited in all its form. Second, drain cleaners and domestic helps are not included within the legal definition of manual scavengers. This is also correct. Though manual scavenging is prohibited in all its form, but what is lacking is the exhaustive definition of who a manual scavenger is. So currently, the definition of manual scavenger does not include drain cleaners, domestic help. 
So the right answer to this question is C, both 1 and 2. Question number 4 is with respect to International Criminal Court. The first statement, it functions under the aegis of United Nations. This is incorrect. The International Criminal Court is not a part of the United Nations and is rather a separate body which functions under the Rome Statute. Second, it tries only criminal cases between countries. Now, this is tricky. Though this is correct that it tries only criminal cases, but it does not entertain cases between countries. Therefore, this statement is wrong. It only tries cases amongst individuals. So, the right answer to this question would become D, neither one nor two. With this, we come to an end for today's discussion. Let's move to the question for the day.